Good afternoon. My name is Tom Bainbridge, and I am the Export Assistance Program Manager of, um, for Ohio Export Assistance with the Ohio Development Services Agency. Um, we are here to present about opportunities for Ohio companies in Australia and New Zealand. Our presenter today is Ohio's contractor in Australia and New Zealand. Her name is Angela Foley. She is the Managing Director of Foley & Associates in Australia and has been working in international trade and investment arena for more than 30 years. Angela has in-depth firsthand <coughs> experience offering international trade advisory and investment attraction services across market sectors and geographical regions. She has spent a large part of her career working with both US and Australian economic development agencies where she has developed a clear understanding of the cultural and economic drivers, plus the logistics of facilitating successful commercial relationships between organizations from both countries. Furthermore, since establishing her company in Sydney in 2002, Angela and her team have worked directly with a large number of organizations from the Great Lakes regions, assisting them in doing business in Australia and New Zealand. Services offered include market research, <coughs> market entry strategy, and identification of in-country partners. Several Ohio companies have used the services of Foley & Associates, and we look forward to working with you in the near future. I, um, I want to also tell everyone that we are recording this. Um, we will post the recording to our website, and we will send an email with the recording <clears throat> and this presentation shortly after <clears throat> the end, hopefully by Monday. So with that, um, I will let Angela have the floor and I will step aside. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Good afternoon to everybody in Ohio. I hope you can all hear me quite clearly. Um, it's morning time in Australia. It's Friday morning. It's about five, just after 5 a.m. It's winter time here, just to put it in perspective. So it's still quite dark in these mornings. But on a positive note, we're already in Friday. So I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. My colleague Chris Evans is also with us and happy to respond to any questions, as Tom said, towards the end of the presentation. But just to summarize what we're going to talk about today, as Tom mentioned, we've had the pleasure of working with Ohio companies for some time here in Australia and New Zealand. And we thought it's a good opportunity as we come to the middle of 2020, I guess just to provide an update on the current environment here in Australia and New Zealand. I really want to talk a little bit about why we think you as Ohio exporters should be looking at this region, or if you're already engaged in the region, continuing to do business here. I will zone in on some industry sectors and opportunities where we see money being spent, which we think present um, specific opportunities for you as Ohio exporters. And we'll wrap up with just some recommendations based on our own experience in the market. And happy to take you questions at the end. And as Tom mentioned, copies of these slides will be available after the event also. So starting out with the first part of the presentation, looking at the current environment here in Australia and New Zealand. And I see my, my byline as, as it were is how have we weathered the crisis and why the economies are expected to bounce back. It's an interesting one because it really is um, a moving target at the moment with regard to what's happening, not just in our economy, but obviously in the United States and around the world as well. But I thought we may as well start just to look at, I guess, the elephant in the room, as it were, COVID-19. And to put it in perspective from Australia and New Zealand's perspective, we, we live in a very international environment here in Australia and New Zealand. So we're always watching the, the, the American news, the British news, um, news what's happening in the region, in Asia, et cetera. So we're very conscious of the impact that COVID-19 has had on different countries and individual states as well. But if you look at our region here and, and population in general, which is important if you're doing business here, 25.7 million in Australia, 5 million in New Zealand. I think if we looked at per capita incidence of confirmed cases, it's pretty low relative to many regions around the world. So 7,500 cases confirmed here in Australia, 103 fatalities at this point, a very strong recovery rate. New Zealand, just 1,500, just over 1,500 cases. 22 fatalities, 98% recovered. And we just picked one day this week, the 24th of June. And this is interesting because New Zealand had thought in general that they had really, you know, 
come out of this pandemic and had zero cases for some time. That changed in the last week where they had two new cases come into the country through returning passengers from the UK. So it just shows that no matter how we think we might have survived and we've moved on, it's still there and we have to be vigilant. We had the same scenario here in Australia just this week where we, we were thinking right across the country that our case levels were so low. And then we had this spike over several days in Melbourne and in a couple of suburbs in Melbourne in particular. And just on yesterday on the 24th, 29 cases in one day. So the impact of that, it's minuscule when compared to some regions, but it still has an impact right across our economies and, and, and the general population and the psyche as well. And we wonder where we go from here if we then go back down into restrictions, et cetera, as well. One point I did want to make, if you, if you see the, the, the map of or, you know, Australia and New Zealand up on the top right hand of the corner of the screen, we talk um, and we have talked for many years about the tyranny of distance. When you live here in this region, you think it's such a long way to travel. If I want to travel to the United States, it's 14 hours minimum to go into LA or San Francisco, 15 or a little bit more to Dallas. If I want to travel to Europe, it's a 14 hour flight to Dubai and then another eight to travel to Amsterdam or Dublin, et cetera, eight or nine. So the tyranny of distance when it comes to travel, whether it's vacation or business, but likewise when it comes to logistics and supply chain, that's always been challenging, but it's actually been a blessing when it comes to a pandemic because we were able to contain our borders pretty quickly. And once we did that, we were able to really, quite a compliant population as well, so once we contained our international borders, it was a little bit easier to comply and to actually really manage the caseload from the point of view of COVID-19. At this point, notwithstanding those spikes in Melbourne this week, our, our federal government is really driving this three-stage plan whereby we really have eased up on restrictions by the end of July. That may change slightly now with what's happening at the moment in Melbourne. But the same as in the US, our states obviously have a say in this as well. And there's a quite a bit of back and forward between the individual states about opening state borders and whether or not we should allow people from Victoria to travel into New South Wales, where our office sits. Queensland border is still remains closed, where Brisbane is, for example, right up the East Coast. Um, they're talking about 10th of July, but that may change now as well. But there is this easing of restrictions. In the last two weeks, I've been out to restaurants, I've been able to go to venues, etc. Um, so we can see that there's light at the end of the tunnel. You'll all be familiar with the term travel bubble um, or travel bridge. So the discussion here is around us having this travel bubble possibly with New Zealand and some of the islands in the region, Pacific Islands. It's under consideration. I thought it would happen earlier, but I heard the chief executive of Qantas Airlines talk yesterday as part of a media conference, and he thought that while it's under discussion, it will take longer for it actually to become a reality. And then what's most important for all of us, because we work in this international environment, is there really are no plans yet to restart broader international travel. So that's challenging when your business is export and your inter business is international trade. I had thought by September, October this year, I could probably travel internationally. And by international, I mean outside the broader region of New Zealand, et cetera. Possibly not the case. It's possibly going to be 2021. And there's two points here. Number one, when we can actually travel without having to undergo these 14 day quarantine restrictions in another country. Um, and then as we return to Australia as well. But the second factor is whether or not I'm comfortable traveling and when I'll be comfortable as a, an individual getting on a plane for 14 hours, for example, and sitting in an enclosed environment. And that's obviously having a massive impact on our, labor, our airlines, our travel industry, et cetera, as well. But thinking about the, the countries as a whole, Australia, New Zealand, no matter what political persuasion you might be, I think there's a general consensus here within our borders that both governments responded very quickly when it comes to economic stimulus packages. Quite complex packages were rolled out quite efficiently in the early stages of the pandemic. And we're aware of the fact we'll be paying for these for a long time to come. But if I talk about Australia being the bigger package, as you can see here, 320 billion Australian dollars about 170 billion of that specifically targeted towards businesses. Businesses like mine, tax incentives, tax credits, um, support if, if turnover had dropped 30% um, or more support in actually paying staff salaries, et cetera, right across the board. 
the interesting point will be how long these stimulus measures will stay in place and how long we can benefit from them and what happens if they're withdrawn come August or come September and what the impact might be on the economy. It may seem relatively positive um, if we talk about COVID cases and our stimulus packages and our response to this, this environment, but it's not all roses as you can see. We've been impacted the same as many other countries around the globe. Two days ago, I had this slide prepared and it was based on an IMF report from April. And at that point, they had predicted global economic growth would fall, I think it was about minus 3.1, 3.2% in 2020. The most recent figures came out in the last 24 hours from the IMF saying minus 4.9%. So a little bit more and more negative, more challenging globally. For Australia, they had predicted in April that our economy this year would, would drop 6.1%. So they've revised that now to say it will drop 4.5%, which is more positive. But I never thought I would say that a drop of 4.5 is positive, but it's more po looking way more positive than it was two months ago. In the region, it's obviously challenging. But one point as well is that particularly for Australia, we, we haven't had a recession since 1991. So there are so many people in, 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 in the work environment here who've never experienced a recession. We managed post GFC in 2008, not to go into recession, just as a result of you know, the four pillars of our banking system, quite risk averse, quite stable, stable governments, et cetera. We managed to go through all of those scenarios and, and at this point now we are in recession and it's challenging. And looking at these statistics, what the IMF is predicting that yes, 2020 will be a particularly challenging year for us here in Australia, but they're also predicting this rebound 4% come 2021. I haven't seen the full revised figures that came out just yesterday um, for New Zealand, but they're still saying that 7.2% drop in 2020 for New Zealand. And I'm not quite sure what the reason for that specifically is, being a stronger drop than for Australia. And 5.9%, so coming back up again in, in 2021. And there's been much debate about this, about the impact in the short term. We're already you know, six months into 2020. So this snapback V that the IMF is predicting is dependent on you know, global trade and business as usual. I think it's probably a little bit too positive, to be honest. And there's also talk um, generally here about what, what, what's been referenced as the happy tick, that because businesses had to innovate so fast and because we've moved to an online environment and looking at technology, whether it's around platforms like Zoom and virtual meetings or moving to e-commerce, um, FinTech, the uptake of you know, technology in the fintech space, et cetera, as well. That because of this innovation, we may actually see this acceleration where we have this happy tick. I don't think that's going to happen, but it would be fantastic if it did. To be honest, I think the reality is going to be this incremental staircase recovery that we can see referenced here. And one of the reasons for that is that it's the most likely scenario here in Australia and New Zealand is that we, we don't live in a silo here. I talk about the tyranny of distance and we're two islands at the other side of the world, but we're dependent on the global environment. And a good example of that is if, if we look at exports out of Australia, there are four or five areas we are particularly strong. Two of those are tourism and international education, key exports for Australia. And they're possibly the two that were impacted the most heavily once COVID-19 came in in 2020. Our borders closed, so we don't have those tourists coming through. Our academic year starts in January, late January, early February. Our universities here are very dependent on international students, full fee paying students. Many of them come from Asia, many of them come from China. So when the academic year started up in January, those students didn't come back into the country. So the flow on effect on universities was, you know, quite, quite, quite quickly they had to think about capital you know, investment projects they may have planned for this year or next year, putting some of those projects on hold. But they also had to think about how do we keep engaged with the students and moving to online education in the short term and keeping those students engaged in the hope that we can have them back and that that industry, as it were, can be retained and grow in future. A positive for education is I have read that because of how Australia and New Zealand have contained the environment, that it would appear that it's actually moved up 
in the scale as an attractive location for international travel or international education in future. So once we can travel, we may see an increase in students coming to this region. But ultimately, that incremental recovery is what I'm actually thinking will happen for this region. So moving along then to, I guess, the basis of the, the presentation today, you know, why we think you should consider Australia and New Zealand and how we might be able to provide some support and advice to you as you plan your next move and think about strategies for 2020 and, and beyond as well. In our business here in Australia, we spend our days talking to companies here in Australia and New Zealand, but also companies in, internationally and predominantly those in, in, in North America and Europe where many of our clients are based. And it's often the international people within those organizations we're speaking to, whether it's the export manager, the international sales manager, et cetera. And it's very interesting because normally that job and that profile means that these people spend their lives on the road, traveling to exhibitions in Europe, in the US, in Asia, completing road shows, demos, meeting with customers. So travel is such a huge component of their business. And suddenly we find these people are sitting in their home offices as I am this morning and as Chris is this morning. And they've got a lot of time to suddenly think about what now and what for the future. So we're all focused, and this is relevant to me as well as a small business here in Australia. We're all focused on the, the short-term wins as it were, managing our cash reserves, ensuring we have cash coming into the business, ensuring we're remaining engaged with our clients. But we also have to think about the long-term strategy. And our key message, I guess, is not to be 100% reactive at this point. You need to manage your clients domestically and internationally, but you also need to start thinking about what kind of market intelligence you require that's going to allow you to plan responsibly to navigate your way out of this situation. Where should you be investing your time and resources going forward? And often when we have these conversations, because we're talking to somebody in the international environment, they tend to start talking about international markets, about what's happening globally, et cetera, and whether they should be moving into new verticals and what's happening in our region and sales internationally, et cetera. And what we try to do is say, hey, hang on, just take a moment and let's take a step back. Let's think about what's happening on the domestic front for you sitting in Cleveland or Cincinnati today and your business. So if you're manufacturing a piece of equipment, for example, or a widget, how has that been impacted by the environment just from the point of view of components and sourcing supply into the business? Has that impacted on your capacity locally within the US and within your region to remain engaged and to seek keep servicing your customers? If you're in professional services, have you been able to remain engaged with your customers domestically if you haven't been able to travel as easily throughout the United States or throughout the region? Do you still have the staff and the expertise or have you had to modify your services to engage in an online environment? Have you had to modify product because you've experienced challenges sourcing a particular item? So starting from there and looking at home base and then looking globally. And our key message here is I'm assuming and, and expect that if you're internationally engaged at this point, you have been speaking to your customers or your importers and distributors in particular key markets. But I think the best advice I can provide based on my experience is to know what questions to ask and ask the same questions of multiple regions. Because then at least you can compare and contrast the answers and the information that you receive. So if you're doing business in Germany, in the UK, in Canada, maybe here in Australia, reach out to your customers if you engage directly with them or to your distributors here or your channel partners. Figure out what questions you need to ask that's going to allow you to come up with a plan to prioritize particular regions and markets as we move out of the pandemic and move into 2021 and beyond. And an important factor here is don't forget what your competitors are doing in the US market or here in our market as well. And we can assist you with that. So referencing government resources like Tom's agency in Ohio on your doorstep. We work with Tom and his colleagues here in Australia and New Zealand, but Ohio has similar partners in many countries around the world. Use those partners to be able to capture a lot of this intelligence to help you plan going forward. That's why we're here. So moving along to what's really happening in the region, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to some of the industry sectors in a moment, but I wanted to talk a little bit about supply chain in general. It's no surprise that global supply chains have been disrupted. 
and there's a shortage of critical items. We've been aware for many years here in this region, particularly in Australia, that we've been dependent on one or two countries. China is an extremely important trade partner for us. And it's been there in the background that maybe we should be diversifying or maybe this could be a problem. And suddenly, with something like a pandemic coming into play, right down to the man or woman in the street, we've realized how fragile global supply chains can be and how it can impact on our lives. So there's been quite a bit in the media, but we can see it for ourselves as well. And it's really made us think about what we need to do going forward. I read a report recently that came out of a, a group in the UK. I think it's called the Henry Jackson Foundation. It's available online, but I'm happy to, to provide a copy if anybody would like it. And it talked about more from an intelligence perspective, the five eyes. So the five eyes being the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand five English speaking nation, nations, but it particularly talked about supply chain risks. And sadly for Australia and New Zealand, if we rank those five countries, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, we're bottom of the board when it comes to our strategic dependence on China for many categories of goods. 595 for Australia, 514 for New Zealand. But more importantly, some of those, 167, have applications in critical national infrastructure. So it may be electronic components, et cetera, and other items. So that's pause for thought for us sitting in this country. And if I just pick one year, 2018, to, to just demonstrate a little bit more, you can see on the left-hand side, 50% or more in red. If I pick some key items that we import here in this country, electrical machinery and equipment, 26 billion in 2000, and 18, 50% of that coming from a single source country. Iron or steel articles, furniture, bedding, and lighting, 69% coming from a single source country. So but to, to put that in perspective, normally at the end of each year, our seasons are different. So when we come into December, we're thinking about summer holidays. We're thinking about Christmas holidays, summer vacation, schools are closing. Businesses are thinking that they're shutting down or maybe going to skeleton staff for a couple of weeks, January. But businesses are always conscious of the fact that once they come back in January, that China moves into New Year. So they want to make sure they have their orders in place, they have product on the water. So when we come back and it's business as usual, as it were, that we have those items that we need to continue to operate here. This year, what we saw in March, Early March, mid-March, we started seeing articles in the newspaper, building companies saying, hey, I have this massive project happening in Melbourne, but I don't have glass. I can't move forward with the project. Because there's been a, a stop, you know, a gridlock and a blockage in the supply chain coming into the country. And right down to, if I go to Bunnings, which is our major big box hardware store chain here in Australia, even in a normal environment, I've always looked at the products that I'm buying in Bunnings and I think, how can I buy this for this price? It's manufactured mostly in China, but in other markets. It's trans, you know, transported to this country. There's margins on the way. Bunnings will take it. They have it on the shelf and I'm still buying a toolbox for $29. And it, may, it amazed me that it, I could buy something that cheaply. But once we see that we don't actually have that luxury because we've been dependent on this one supplier because we're probably buying on price, that suddenly 40% of the nuts, the screws and the bolts that we use are coming from a single source. And if we don't have them, they're going to impact day to day. And I really want to stress it's not just China. Right around the world, we're, we, we, we've become here in Australia dependent to a large degree on imports. And part of that is that we, we with 25 and a half million population, we really don't have the economies of scale to manufacture many large items here. We would have to focus on export as well, and it goes back to that tyranny of distance. So we've allowed ourselves to become more dependent on those imports coming in. It's easier to source them. But suddenly in 2020, we saw that some of these key items, so whether it's medical equipment, medicines, pharmaceuticals, we're sourcing those from around the world. So at this point, We've had that in the, back, so in the back of our minds for years, but we've really had to think about it. And this presents opportunities for you as exporters, because th this debate has become very real in Australia, particularly thinking about onshoring some critical functions. 
we're not going to go back to large scale manufacturing of large pieces of equipment in the short term. I can't see that happening. And it's a whole other discussion and a presentation about energy costs here and labor costs, et cetera, to make that a challenging scenario. But we really do need to think of some of those critical functions. And if we are going to bring some manufacturing onshore, then we need to make sure that we can automate processes to make it cost effective. So we need to look for solutions and technologies and applications that are going to allow us to do that, presenting opportunities for you. Likewise, as I mentioned earlier, we really need to think about just general diversification, geographical diversification, not to be dependent on one region or one country for sourcing items to start looking to the US and to other markets. So this presents an opportunity for you as a US exporter to start talking to your distributors here in Australia or to start engaging with the distributors if you're not working with them here to say, hey, we can provide this. There's a free trade agreement between the United States and Australia. The tariffs are pretty much down at zero. We can competitively offer this solution. And I think it's an attractive proposition at this point. So moving along to some particular sectors and opportunities, I just wanted to take a moment to, to say, you know, this is the same right around the world. We all stopped traveling early March, less planes in the sky, less cars on the road, pollution, positive impact on pollution. The fog has lifted, the smog has lifted, and it's a new reality for us in many, in many environments, which has been quite positive, but it's the same scenario for business where it's really actually made people stop and take a look, at, a look at how we do business and think about how we could do business better. So what I've done for this third section of the presentation is just focus on a couple of sectors that we think link in with expertise and capabilities in Ohio. And I have seen um, the details of who've registered for this webinar today. And I know there will be some of you listening in and it may not apply, you may not sit under one of these particular industry sectors. We're more than happy via Tom to talk to you offline in future or to have a Zoom call or a Skype call at some point and talk about your industry or your product. There's no issue, 5 p.m. in Ohio is 7 a.m. here, it's easy for us to do that over our morning coffee. But just talking about a couple of these sectors and I'm, I'm quite conscious of time as well, so I'll move along. At the very beginning of this uh, webinar, I talked about two of our key export markets being tourism and education. A third is agriculture. We like to see ourselves here in Australia and likewise in New Zealand as being the food bowl of Asia, but not just being the food bowl of Asia, being the clean food bowl of Asia. Quarantine is very stringent, biosecurity is very stringent. If I talk about Australia in particular, we're a very large landmass, small population relative, we're all hugging the coast to a degree, so a very large percentage living on the coast. And then we have this vast areas of land that we can use for agriculture, whether it's in Western Australia, in the wheat fields, whether it's cattle farms up in the Northern Territory, right across the board, you know, tomatoes in Victoria, et cetera, right across the board. And it's been a tough environment in recent years. Many of you will be aware of the fact that we had bushfires towards the end of last year and coming into January, 2020. We hadn't had rain for quite some time. Our farmers were quite challenged. Many regions, particularly in New South Wales, if I think of you know, regional New South Wales, the farmers had been in drought for some time. And suddenly in February, the rains came and the farmers were literally dancing in the paddocks at one point thinking, this is fantastic. This is going to be a bumper year. And then obviously the pandemic hit a month later. Hasn't directly impacted on this industry particularly when we look at confirmed cases of COVID because that's more in the, the urban environment. Another interesting fact that was noted that when the pandemic hit and we saw that lockdown in China, I read that there was a noted increase in demand for food and sourcing of food from Australia and New Zealand by Chinese importers. They were looking to secure clean food as it were and to, and, and to secure food supply effectively. <clears throat> So what does that mean for you? So we have our wheat, we have our cotton farms, et cetera. But again, we're, we, we, we're, a, we're a big importer of agricultural equipment, whether it's John Deere, whether it's Caterpillar, et cetera. But likewise, we're a big importer of, chemical, of chemicals, of fertilizers, et cetera. 
And then moving along to the next stage, and I think if we talk about Industry 4.0, and it goes back to the same scenario again, our labor costs are high. We normally have backpackers coming through that will work their way around Australia and work in you know, fruit picking, et cetera. That's not happening this year. We're increasing production, but we need to be able to do it efficiently. So there has been this trend in moving more towards investing in robotics and drone technology, automation technologies, right through the supply chain, from harvesting right through to food production. Anyone that plays in that space, I would encourage you to look at Australia and New Zealand. We've had companies come through, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, and visit the market very successfully here and engage with local importers, with local end customers in the space. And that moves us into advanced manufacturing in general. Possibly the key to rebuilding local industry and onshoring some critical functions. So Australia is actually very strong in this space when it comes to smart tech, when it comes to sensors, et cetera, and how we integrate those solutions into food production, medical engineering, mining, and right across industries. But we don't want to reinvent the wheel as well. So therefore, we do look internationally to find expertise and to partner and to collaborate. Again, presenting opportunities for you sitting in Ohio. And it doesn't mean that we're not looking at those traditional areas of expertise. We know Ohio is particularly strong when, it, when, when we talk about exporting machinery. This is a relatively important market for Ohio in that space. That opportunity remains, but there are further opportunities as you move into the advanced manufacturing space as well. So looking at a couple of other industries, and as we'll share this information post the webinar, I won't dwell on the detail of some of these slides. <clears throat> any country will always have their nation building or their state building projects like transport, infrastructure, road, etc., airports. That's the same here in Australia. What our government has done, and I would imagine it's the same in the US, to support the stimulus packages we have is actually to look at where else they can push money through the economy. We have these projects already in play. We have timelines in play on a state basis. And I'm using New South Wales here as an example, where we had a clear timeline and budgets linked in for key infrastructure projects across the state. So this is our most populated state, with Sydney being the capital city. So what the government has done, and other states have done the same thing, is said, OK, how can we move these projects forward? So we now have this quite big spend happening, but in a shorter time frame up to 2023 to stimulate the economy. So roads and transport, health infrastructure. You may not play in that space. So if we think about health infrastructure, yes, we are building new hospitals, whether it's with state departments of health, public hospital funding, or private sector chains like Ramsey and HealthScope, two of our biggest private hospital providers here. But you may see somewhere down, down the supply chain in that. So if we're building more hospitals, there may be opportunities for you whether it's supplying you know, equipment for operating theaters, hospital beds, et cetera, radiology equipment, who knows? Well, the same happening in New Zealand, stimulating the economy by pushing some of that money through. Response and recovery funds, um, recovery fund from New Zealand, I've seen the same in US and elsewhere, and contingency funds, pushing that through for infrastructure investment. I mentioned health and infrastructure, or health infrastructure a few moments ago. I also mentioned earlier the very fact that we import quite a lot of that equipment coming into Australia. So as we build more hospitals, it presents more opportunities. And the US is one of our key suppliers in this space. So definitely one that I would be investigating, but it's not just the medical devices and the large scale, scale medical equipment we use in hospitals. We've talked for many years about moving um, online, as it were, with e-health records digitalizing the process when it comes to health and how we manage health. This pandemic has accelerated that, um, particularly when it comes to telehealth and remote patient monitoring solutions. We've talked about that in Australia because we have communities living in regional and rural environments that our states have had to service when it comes to health. But suddenly we have a pandemic and, and even myself as a consumer, I, I don't want to go to the emergency department 
because I don't want to walk into a hospital in case there could be some issues around infection with COVID-19. My GP doesn't want to see me because they want to make sure that I'm not coming in if I'm presenting with any symptoms. So it's telephone consultations, some of them moving to video consultations. Possibly the way of the future, and our government has now come on board with more funding in that space as well. One aspect I do want to mention if you're looking at this space is clinical validation of any solution you may offer is key. So there's an appetite when it comes to private hospital chains or our medical insurance companies like Medibank or NIB, et cetera, to invest in technologies that's going to keep me in the home longer so I'm not taking up valuable space in hospitals. But they're not going to be comfortable doing that if I'm just using an app on my phone to, say, to tell my doctor, sure, I can check my vital signs after major surgery. I'll be fine. I really need to be using health tech that's been clinically validated and that you know, our, our specialists and our GPs have a level of confidence in. And that's where we're seeing medical you know, insurance companies and hospital chains like Ramsey, et cetera, investigating those innovative solutions. So certainly one I would consider for anyone who looks in that space. I won't comment too much about the biotech sector. It's relatively small here and it's very international. So our biotech community really looks outward when it comes to venture capital raising. Um, particularly to the US market when it comes to partnering. But Australia does market itself very strongly when it comes to research and development here. Our government has very strong tax incentives that make it attractive for big pharmaceutical companies to come in and conduct clinical trials, for example, here in Australia. This figure is interesting, about a thousand clinical trials commenced in Australia each year, worth a billion dollars Australian to the economy. I was on a webinar yesterday just talking about biotech and the Australian-US relationship. And one of the key takeaways from that was the clinical trials and how we conduct them will change in this new environment. And that's again, moving forward to the tech space and the tech engagement and capturing of data, et cetera, and using artificial intelligence in that scenario. One other area, um, I guess, precision medicine, particularly looking at genomics is probably the one area that's quite strong here. Because again, of that focus of shifting the balance of healthcare spending from this very costly lifetime management of chronic conditions to that more cost-effective early intervention. So focused on precision medicine, quite strong funding allocated to, towards that here. What's of interest to you is, and I've used the Genomics Health Alliance as a, an example, a collaboration of organizations and research institutions focusing on precision medicines, focusing on genes, and the federation of data. We've tended to work in silos state by state here. So there's research happening in, in South Australia, there's research happening in Queensland. Let's actually combine that data, use artificial intelligence and other technologies to actually come up with some solutions that's going to allow us to be a healthier nation that lives longer. But one key aspect of that is international partnering, whether it's around clinical institutions in the US and here, or universities, definitely presenting opportunities for similar clinics, similar universities in Ohio. I think of two other areas I'll just reference very quickly. Our research and development tax incentives here have been quite attractive to attract in Boeing and Lockheed Martin to do quite strong research here in this country. Flowing right down through maintenance and repair operations quite strong here, whether it's for civil or defense. But I can't really comment much on this at this point because our airlines have been so severely challenged by the COVID-19 um, experience and the lack of international travel. Virgin, our two key airlines being Queen, Qantas and Virgin. Virgin, very challenged at the moment in the equivalent, of, I think it's the equivalent of chapter 11 in the US. So in administration, we have two parties bidding to take over. Qantas yesterday very sadly announced major um, job cuts and pretty much moving many, many airplanes into storage over not just the next 12 months, the next 24 months and beyond, because we don't have that international travel in the short term. But in a regular environment, quite strong expertise in this space, particularly with regard to carbon fiber technology and right down through the supply chain on the civil side, but also in the defense space. And the defense space, that's quite, quite strong and quite attractive. Our defense budget's been increasing and a strong focus on building up the industry and the sources of supply here as well. And to wrap up um, from looking at sectors, just very briefly, because I know it's quite an important 
export market for Ohio and, and, and particularly into this region. We've talked about some of the industries. We've talked about the fact that we're an importing nation, as it were. But I wanted to reference particularly when I think about agriculture and the increase in demand right through to food and beverage. Obviously, the demand in chemicals is going to increase. Very stringent from a regulatory environment. You have to work your way through that if you are exporting in that space. We can certainly assist you with that. But one sector to consider for this region here. And before I wrap up, just referencing some key events. Many have been postponed, some still taking place, some taking place in an online environment. So some of the key ones where we see a strong presence from, from the United States, one being Avalon, our air show, was due to take place in February 2020. They've moved it to November. Quite a, lot, quite a strong US state presence of that in recent years. So they obviously see opportunities here. Health tech, there are so many health tech events happening in this country because the spend on digital health and health tech is so strong, one that I consider as well. But if anyone is interested in any of these events or activities, feel free, free to reach out to us through Tom or directly. Happy to provide you with an update and advice. And we go to many of these events where possible as well. So it may be that we're actually attending an event that could be attractive to you and we can pick up some information or speak to some contacts on your behalf in future. So to wrap up, I guess, next steps, developing a plan of action. We've talked about focusing on the short-term wins. We're all doing that, but developing a long-term strategy. Knowing what questions to ask and, and accessing the resources that are available to you, particularly through Tom's agency, if you're looking at international, looking at export markets. Because that strong market knowledge and the key to response, you know, to navigating out of this situation is going to be really based on having a, a good foundation and having a plan and having that intelligence you need to move forward. So Tom can obviously talk about his agency and, and the services that they offer to companies like yourselves when it comes to being export ready, identifying new export markets, and then engaging with potential partners and end customers in, in those regions as well. And from our perspective, as I mentioned, this is what we do every day. We're constantly out there in the marketplace talking to customers, talking to potential competitors of yours, identifying what's happening in the region, qualifying prospective partners for companies from the US. And when we get to the point that you can actually visit, assisting you with those visit programs. One final point I wanted to make is we have just completed this week our first virtual trade mission and it came from Wales in the UK. We had seven food and beverage companies. There had been a plan they would visit the market. They obviously couldn't travel, but we went through with the market research, partner identification. Chris, who's on the line with me today, was very heavily involved in setting up many of those meetings, all taking place through Zoom as a platform. They've all happened. They've had fantastic discussions. The Welsh Government is so happy with the outcome so far that they're now planning an actual physical visit in 2021 with those same companies. So at this point, They've actually started the discussions, they've engaged with prospective partners in country, and we've done quite a bit of research for them. So something to think about going forward, if you can't travel here in the next six months, the next 12 months, maybe we can do it virtually. And with that, I want to wrap up and thank you for taking the time to listen to me today and to pass back to Tom. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Angela. It was a fantastic job. I appreciate it. Um, if anyone has any questions, in the meantime, I see that we have one in the um, in the chat session by Rachel Horvath, and uh, maybe you or Chris can answer this. Um, what is your assessment of the pet food industry and demand in Australia? Oh, I can I can make reference to that, but I can also you're on mute. Have you muted me, Tom? Can you hear me? Can you still hear me, Tom? Uh, I can hear you, okay, Angela. Tom, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, good. Um, I can comment briefly on the pet food industry, but we've also done some research in that space and we can share it with Tom after today's webinar, but um, as an animal lover, I can tell you that I was um, 
happy to see that we're one of the biggest spenders, as it were, on pet food and pet equipment per capita in the world, Australia and New Zealand. So this is a, a we, we, we treat our animals like our children effectively. And I've often thought if there was one industry I, I should move into, it's actually um, pet food, but also equipment and that whole space because the spend is very big here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, one thing to think about for pet food is it is quite regulated. So you have to be compliant um, with regard to the ingredients, et cetera, and, and, and how you market it. But we have some information on that. But definitely from the brief research we've conducted in, in recent months on that, it's one market I would be encouraging you to consider both for Australia and for New Zealand. If anyone has, has any questions, feel free to go to the Q&A section. Um, we have another one. Julio Contreras asks, um, regarding the agriculture industry, what event do you recommend we should attend? Okay. In, in New Zealand, there's a, if it's agricultural equipment, in New Zealand, there is a major event called um, Hamilton Field Days, is what we refer. It, and, and I'll have to get the exact name, but it's in Hamilton in New Zealand, a couple of hours outside Auckland. And from an international perspective, if you're involved in the supply of agricultural equipment, I would be saying travel to Hamilton Field Days. Normally it takes place in June. Jenny from our office has, has visited. We've had clients exhibit there. And really anybody who's anybody in the industry will attend that. If I think of Australia, we have quite a few regional field days. And I'll share those with you after this event today, Tom, so you can pass through as well. We'll have to look at which ones may have been rescheduled or postponed but it tends to be more regional here in Australia and New Zealand. We have quite a few number of field days as well for that industry. Excellent. And um, we have a question. We service the library market with book protection and repair products. Can you comment on the potential in your region? An interesting one because I'd have to learn more about the offering. And I, I've, I've done research in the library space here before, but it was many years ago. So we obviously have our, our national libraries, we have our university libraries, our school libraries, et cetera, and then at local municipality level. But I'd really have to investigate the detail and possibly look at competitors locally. So, uh, I mean, I, I would imagine we would have companies servicing that space here, but if you have something that's quite a unique offering, there are opportunities because if you think about it, it's, it's relatively easy to identify the size of the market. If you think of those different areas that I mentioned, whether it's university or, you know, local municipality, local community libraries, et cetera. But I'd really have to think about it from a competitor space and just look at the offering here, but happy, happy to have a look at the offering or look at your website and, and provide some comment. <clears throat> Ellie, I will uh, get in touch with you and respond to your email very shortly. Um, thank you for that question. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the um, Q&A. Um, a couple things that I'd like to mention, um, many of you are aware of the, uh, the things we do um, in the Export Assistance Group with the state of Ohio. Uh, we do have contractors in more than 80 markets around the world and pretty much any single region that you'd want to cover. Um, we also have um, an internship program that is currently going on right now. Um, many of those interns are on the line with us right now. And we will start recruiting again um, companies throughout the state sometime in the uh, mid fall for next year's um, cohort. Uh, we also have a grant which helps companies market and travel internationally, uh, as well as help them with trade shows and trade missions. Um, when they start up again. Um, so if any of you are interested in any of that, um, we will of course be in touch. Um, our email address and um, uh, URL as well as my phone number is on the last slide there. Um, feel free to get in touch. Um, we will send the presentation as well as um, a link to the recording to you very shortly. I'm hoping to have the recording posted on YouTube um, by Monday, if that is possible. So um, with that, I think I will call it a day. And we're a little early. 
Thank you very much for attending.